Mumbai sir. Did his schooling, UG, everything from Mumbai, and then went to UT Austin for PhD. Then spent four years at IBM Research, yeah. and then after that, uh, he has been with uh, Georgia Tech. So uh, his research interests uh, mostly on memory system, architecture, security, and quantum computing. I'm pretty sure all of you, if you have taken a course in architecture, you must have read at least one paper when going, if not many. Right. So he's a fellow of IEEE, ACM uh, awards from Intel, IBM, and uh, so on. And I think recently he got the ACM Cigar uh, Morris Award, which is pretty prestigious in our community. So uh, I think if I keep on uh, you know, expanding the bio, it will take one hour. So let me stop here and uh, go to you, Moin. Thank you, Biswa. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I, I, I was telling Biswa that I was reminded of my undergrad days. I used to come here for tech, techno wait. There was the technical festival. I don't know if it still happens. It used to be in December, January. It was like one of the things to do. If you are in one of the undergrad colleges around, you come here and, and participate. And I had friends here. Uh, so I used to come. So, so they have a lot of fond memories uh, of this place. Before I get into the talk, let me sample a little bit. How many of you are undergrad students? Grad students. Okay. How many of you are in computer architecture? Okay. So some of the things that I'm going to talk, especially if you're not working in computer architecture, like what, how is DRAM made? What's a bank? What's a row? Feel free to ask. I have some content that I wanted present, I plan to present, but I don't have to, right? I'd much rather that this be an interactive talk, and if we get to only half of the content that we plan to present, that's perfectly fine. I can always refer you to the papers, and you can go and read if you're interested, right? So the, the, the more we interact, the better it is. So don't feel shy about asking anything, even if it's like basic background material that you may not be aware of. I'm happy to, to go into it. So I'll be talking about Rohammer. This is a problem that's been happening for almost a decade now, um, and, and some of the work that we have been doing. Um, and there's, there's a comment online. I think somebody's mic might be on. Um, so I've been working on memory reliability, memory security for almost a decade now. And to capture the essence of working in this area, let's think about security and reliability in other areas as well. So before 2019 became infamous for something else, it was infamous for Yeah, it was infamous for something else. In 2019, there were plane crashes, Boeing 737, and there were multiple plane crashes. For unknown reasons, these planes would just fall out of the sky to a point where Boeing 737 planes were just grounded. There were like 300 planes. They were all just grounded. And this is a big deal for aviation. And there was a big task force to figure out what happens. And turns out that Boeing 737 actually had some optional safety features that if these planes had, they would not crash. But these safety features were extra. So of course, low cost airlines then pay for those extra. And this tends to be the overwhelming problem in the area of reliability and security. Everybody wants reliability. Everybody wants security. Nobody wants to pay for it. So if you have a solution that's costly, in terms of practical adoption, that's a huge barrier. So even for computer systems, when we are developing solutions for security or reliability, the emphasis is on developing low-cost solutions. Otherwise, yes, theoretically, you might solve a problem, but practically, it will not get adopted. 
Okay. If you look at the story of computing, the story of computing is really about the story of scaling. For the last 50 years, what we have been able to do is reduce the feature size, make transistors smaller, make cells smaller, pack more things in the same area, and architects were able to develop better systems, and then people at the top were able to build better applications and software using those better processors and systems. Scaling is a type that raises all boats. It doesn't matter what domain you work in. It doesn't matter whether you care about performance, you care about area, you care about power. Scaling just raises all boats. So the, the, the problem for the last few years or almost a decade has been that scaling used to give us more transistors than we could use it. Now it's not just giving us more transistors, even that's sometimes questionable, but even if it gave us more transistors, these transistors tend to be crummy, unreliable. And this unreliability causes unintended consequences. One of that, that consequence is rho hammer. So let's look at memory. Right? So what happens in memory, the, the main type of technology that's used for making main memories is DRAM, dynamic random access memory. You store charge on a capacitor, and that is basically your cell. You pack a bunch of cells. When you do scaling, you pack more cells in the same area. Now the problem is that previously these, these the, 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 the difference from the center between the two cells was somewhat larger. Now it becomes smaller and smaller. So all of these intercell interference effects that were there previously, they were at a smaller magnitude. They just tend to become larger and larger magnitude. One of the most dominant intercell interference is what's called rho hammer. The idea behind rho hammer, so DRAM consists of rows and columns. To access a data, you have to access a row. If you keep accessing a row again and again and again and again, you'd cause bit flips in nearby row. Right? So these frequently accessed rows are called aggressors. And the cell that just got clobbered for no fault of its own is called the victim. Right? In fact, you're not even accessing the victim. Just because you're accessing a row, you leak away a tiny amount of charge from the neighboring cells. A single activation doesn't cause that much damage. But if you keep doing it, the tiny amount of charge leaks away, tiny amount of charge leaks away, tiny amount of charge leaks away. The sum total of that charge loss over time is enough for a cell to flip. Right? So that's basically what's called a row hammer based bit flip. And this, this was discovered in 2014. And you might say, fine, some bit, bits flip, so what's a big deal? I mean, bit flip happens every now and then. This one is different. And a user can do something to cause bit flips in the data that the user cannot even access. You've given somebody a very powerful tool to flip bits in unauthorized region of memory. Think about page tables. As a user, you cannot modify page tables. But now, if you have a row that's adjacent to a page table and you access it again and again and again, what will happen? You can flip bits in the page table. Page table is a very powerful entity. Remember that page table tells you whether you are a user or a kernel. If I can just flip that bit, I can become from a user to a kernel. I can do pretty much whatever I want. Right? You can take over the system by just flipping a bit. <coughs> by flipping bits in the page frame number, you can instead of go to this page, you can go to some other page. Right? And these are not just theoretical. Rohammer was discovered in 2014, and within a year, Google demonstrated that you can use Rohammer to take over the system. And since then, there have been numerous attacks that have shown that you can use row hammer to cause security vulnerabilities. Right? So, so row hammer is not just a reliability problem. It's a serious security problem. You've given somebody a tool to, uh, to potentially take over the system. Right? And, and there's, there's no software solution for this, like in terms of it, the, the, the attacker is able to modify data that the attacker doesn't even have access to. Right? So it's not that 
you can build a better protection in terms of a better paging system. Um, so, so Ruhamid has been around for since 2014, and of course, people have done some work to address it. Right? It's not that people haven't done uh, anything. The problem with Ruhamid, though, is that it's a moving target problem. When it was first discovered in 2014, the number of activations required to cause a bit flip was about 140,000. And you have to do this within 64 millisecond because in 64 millisecond, everything gets refreshed again. It's, so you have to cause those activations within a short period of time. 140,000 is a lot of accesses. It's like 10% of all the possible activations that can go to a bank happens on only one row. So you really have to craft and a pattern to cause it. As we've made smaller and smaller DRAM devices, this threshold keeps dropping because the cells keep coming closer and closer. And so you can notice that about the, the last characterization was done about three or three years ago, and it had dropped to about 5K. What's the threshold now? We don't actually know because the new characterization studies haven't come. You can expect that maybe it's in the low thousands. How about five years from now? We can just take the projections, right? maybe a few hundreds. So that's really the problem that solutions that work here don't really work here. Solutions that work here don't really work here. Fundamentally, how do we develop solutions that are scalable to lower and lower thresholds while still being practical? Right? We, we are objective is to develop something that's practical and still scales to low threshold. So people have worked on Rohama quite a bit. The, the common way to mitigate is uh, you just try to figure out which rows are getting access a lot. Aggressor rows or hot rows, they're called. Once you can identify the aggressor rows, you have some mitigating action. What could be the mitigating action? Well, just refresh the, the, the rows neighboring the aggressor. That's a victim refresh. In fact, this is something that has adopted in DDR4. So all of your memories that you use right now in your phones, in your laptops, any computers that you have actually has this mitigation. Target row refresh. Uh, that has some aggressor row tracking, and when you identify an aggressor, just refresh the victim row. What's the problem? This has been broken. Industry don't really have very good trackers because they can't really afford a lot of space, so they have tiny amount of trackers, and those trackers are very not very good at handling all the possible aggressor rows. So this is sort of like a, a science on its own. The are papers that get best paper award at the top security venues, uh, trespass, and then now there is a fuzzer based uh, pattern generator that can break pretty much all TRR implementation. So trackers are broken. Even if your trackers are perfect, the act of mitigation itself has now been used by attackers to cause new attacks. If you keep attacking the same row again and again and again, what will the mitigation do? The mitigation will refresh the neighbors, right? Refresh the neighbors, refresh the neighbors, refresh the neighbors. What happens? Something that is at a two distance of two away will now start getting flips. So this was a very interesting attack from Google called Half Double that does this. Even if your attacker was perfect, the act of victim refresh itself can cause bit flips. We are at a threshold where this is this is doable. So the goal of our work for the last two, two and a half years has been how do we build better trackers that can scale to low threshold without breaking the bank? They still need to have very low uh, overhead in terms of implementation, both SRAM overhead and performance overhead. Second, how do we build a mitigating action that's different than victim refresh so that these complex pattern attacks don't really affect the mitigation? Right? I'll pause here. Any questions so far? 
How many of you have heard sir, of... Sir, this is a Sushant here. Okay, go ahead, Sushant. So, what, what is the actual functioning of the Ruh Hammer and how it is so vulnerable to security attacks? I want to understand that. So, there is no function of Ruh Hammer, right? Ruh Hammer is an, uh, an access pattern that if you access some DRAM address a lot of times, it just causes bit flips in the nearby rows. It's a function of the physical devices, the proximity of the devices. And because bit flips happen and somebody has a way to cause bit flips in the data that they can't even access, it's just a powerful tool, right? You've now given somebody an ability to modify arbitrary data in memory, regardless of whether they have access to it or not. And, and that's what makes it like so powerful in terms of security vulnerabilities because if you give me that ability, I'll just flip bits in the page table, take over the system, right? So, so, so to, Rohammer is a phenomena, it's an access pattern that causes bit flips. Because it causes bit flips in arbitrary data, that's where the security implications come from. And what are these bit flips? Bit flip is flipping of a bit in a in a DRAM memory. So if the bit was 1, it becomes 0. If a bit was 0, it becomes 1. Okay. So is it the Rohammer is used in all the electronic devices or in the flights in the planes only? No, no. The first slide has nothing to do with the rest of the talk, right? It was just setting up the argument that security and reliability solutions need to be low cost to get adopted. All current systems use, all current systems use some type of DRAM, either, either it's LPDDR DRAM or DDR4 DRAM, and all of this DRAM is vulnerable to row, row hammer. So pretty much all of our current systems you can cause row hammer on. So it is also used in the mobile Mobile phone, laptop, desktop, server, supercomputers, everything. It is quite vulnerable to the security attacks. Yeah, mem exactly. So, so memories are vulnerable to Rohammer and Rohammer can be used for launching security attacks. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So refresh rate... <laughs> So refresh is typically determined by um, JEDEC. It's, it's a consortium that defines standards. So like JEDEC defined DDR4, 64 millisecond refresh. Pretty much all DRAM until DDR4 had 64 millisecond refresh. The current generation DDR5 has 32 millisecond refresh. So an interesting thing to ask is what if I just double my refresh rate, will this problem go away? In 2014, when Rohammer was first discovered, Apple released a patch that did exactly that, double the refresh rate. The, the, the problem is that the time it takes to cause 5,000 activations is fairly small. It's like one millisecond. So currently, it takes us about four millisecond to refresh the entire memory. So even if the, even if the memory was just refreshing all the time and not doing anything else, will still not be able to mitigate row hammer. But it's a function of the threshold. If the threshold was large, faster refresh would be OK. Our thresholds are such that now it just takes very little time to cause bit flips. Yes? So good question. Where are the, who tracks and who issues the mitigation? Currently, so, so the, the TRR implementation that I mentioned is an in DRAM mitigation. Yeah, so, so the problem is that in DRAM mitigations can only afford about 16 tracker entries. I can have like a thousand aggressor rows. Of course, with 16 entries, it's hard to have th support thousand aggressor rows. That's why it's easy to break it. You can have more number of entries at the memory controller. But even that becomes costlier. I'll, I'll go into that, how, how costly that is. Yes? Yeah, 
do a bit flip in a particular code, the bit will, will be added. So there is a science here. People have written papers called as Feng Shui of Rohammer. So that they'll tell you exactly what you need to do to cause bit flips in page tables. So first, allocate a two megabyte region of memory, then access and figure out which bits flip, and then remove that page, and then access a lot of page tables entries, and so it'll go there. So, so there's a science to how to use row hammer bit flips to cause particular bits to fail in the page table right so so th there is a process that uh, attackers follow yes so that's a, that's a very good question right charge leaks but how does charge accumulate what DRAMs typically do is that they don't really just store zero as absence of the charge and one as presence of the charge they have cells and anti cells pretty much half of the row half of the cells in your DRAM are anti cells in which one denotes the absence of charge and zero denotes the presence of charge right uh, so anti cells can cause a zero to one flip true cells can only cause one to zero flip so you can only lose charge so anti cell is basically think about it as take all the data, pass it through a NOT gate. So whenever you're storing a 1, you're actually storing a 0. I think it's roughly 50-50 and, and it's pretty much done to ensure like regardless of what, what data you store, you, you sort of get a uniform distribution of the amount of charge that's stored on the chip. So, so directionality is maintained in the row. So rows are typically give you monotonic failure. So if a bit, if row hammer causes a bit flip to go from 1 to 0 in a particular row, then all of the cells in that row can o typically go only in that direction. But if it's an anti-cell row, the reverse is true. And, and people have exploited this to develop monotonic pointers and, and so, so, so people have leveraged this uh, as well. Okay. So let's start talking about trackers. Basically, so the, the first study uh, I'll present is something that, that we did last year at ISCA. So why trackers break? Ruhamir is a race against time. An attacker has 64 millisecond. It takes about 45 nanosecond to sort of activate a row and then activate another row. That, that, that gap is about 45 nanoseconds. So you can say, well, how many times can I cause an activation in a bang in 64 millisecond? Take 64 millisecond, divide by 45 nanosecond, you get roughly 1.4 million. So, so this is your sort of budget, activation budget for an attacker. Now you can spend this on 1.4 million rows one time, one row 1.4 million times and everything else in between. And the reason why attackers break or trackers break is that the number of rows that you can attack and still reach the threshold is a function of the threshold. The threshold was 100,000, then you can only have about 14 rows that can reach the threshold. Your budget is 1.4 million, of course you can only have 10. So 10 entries per bank is fine, if you already knew which, which rows are going to reach the threshold. We don't deal with one bank, our typical memory module has like 32 banks, fine, it's still not so bad. And this is actually what typical indie RAM implementations have. What happens if the threshold goes down by 10x? That 14 becomes 140. Another 10x, it becomes 1400 per bank. Multiply by the number of banks, you need roughly 50k entries. Each entry is about 4 bytes. So that's 200 kilobytes. And that if 
you already knew which rows are a priori going to reach the threshold. Typically you don't know, so you need to track a little bit more. Who is paying for this like 200 or roughly a quarter megabyte of storage? DRAM companies won't. It's a quarter megabyte of SRAM that they just don't have. So the basic problem with Rohammer is whatever worked here doesn't work here. Whatever worked here doesn't work here. And you could say, well, why don't we just take this and apply when the threshold was high? It's not cost effective. Right. Why aren't memory companies sir, just doing this? Go ahead. Sir, sir Sushant this side. Hmm. Can we see as for example as a sun as a row hammer? I don't understand the question. Can you repeat it? Can we say that sun also acts as a row hammer? So for row hammer, so uh, can you elaborate sun, the question? Sun. Sun also acts as a row hammer who attacks the earth and then there are, uh, there are different layers of uh, topography which helps to control the rays. So I don't... I to understand. They act as a, uh, act as a row and then the, you know, it, it slowly, it, it, the, the temperature becomes not that high on the earth. So can it be called as a row hammer? Sun? So, so I... I, I if, if we were to come to examples, I'll, I'll talk about examples and high temperature in about 20 minutes. How about we hold questions till then? Sounds good? Sounds good. Okay. So, so, so that, that's basically the problem that as thresholds reduce, the number of rows that can be attacked keeps increasing and memory companies cannot really afford this they cannot afford larger and larger trackers. So they don't give you larger trackers, they give you trackers that have like these many entries. And of course, if you have 14 entries and a thousand attack rows, your 14 entries are not, is not going to work and of course it's going to break. And that's what really is happening. So, I mean, people have developed trackers, right? Like the bunch of papers on trackers. So the graphene is like the best, it has a cam, but then there was a paper called TWICE, counter adaptive trees. There is also a paper that uses like bloom filter, multi hash bloom filter, and whatnot. And then the last one is a naive design. If I have n rows, I just need n counters. No tagging, nothing. Every row has a dedicated counter. It's a direct map structure. You just go, you row address, and you get the counter, right? So that's, that's that one. When well, the thresholds were 32 okay? Look at the, the efficiency, 5 kilobyte and 3.8 megabyte. But we have gone long past this. What happens at lower threshold? Let's say this. 700 kilobyte of CAM, very expensive. The naive design requires only 2 megabyte. These intelligent trackers require more than 2 megabyte because they also need tags. Right. So the intelligent designs at lower threshold incur more overhead than even the, the naive design. Even the most storage efficient solution is actually not that attractive. 700 kilobytes of CAM, 2 megabyte, it's like... Uh. How do we have trackers? We don't want to pay this much. Nobody's going to pay this much. If you tell the memory companies, the memory company says, we are giving you this $40 DIM, we're not going to give you like two megabytes of SRAM on it. Just not possible. If you go to Intel and say, can you give me two megabytes of SRAM because I want to mitigate this Rohammer, say, I'll use that two megabytes as a cache to give better performance to my customers. Why would I give you two megabytes of SRAM? So nobody wants to pay, right? Our goal keep it very low, 64 kilobytes. Why 64 kilobyte? This is similar to what Intel SDX had at their memory controller for security, improving, secure, improving SDX. <coughs> so I said, fine, you can't give me SRAM, but what if I just kept counters in the DRAM? DRAM space is cheap, right? Two megabytes out of 32 gigabytes, who cares? It's, uh, it's only a small amount of storage. 
but your counters are there. It's not whenever you access a row, you have to get the counter, increment it, write it back. And whenever you activate, you don't know if you've reached the threshold or not. So if it's not there, you actually have to get it. Every memory access will require a memory access now. So fine, implement caching. And this is something that we did. A cache that cached the DRAM base counts on chip. It doesn't, doesn't work that well. Like if you have a 64 kilobyte cache, 128 kilobyte cache, 256 kilobyte cache, the locality in row accesses is just not there as much as within the row. So if you keep the counts in DRAM, it takes about 25% performance. Like, not acceptable, right? Too much slowdown. So we, what we're saying is that we can't really give SRAM storage, and we can't afford the slowdown of DRAM-based solutions. So what should we do, SRAM or DRAM? The answer is yes. And the basic idea behind this is this is a hybrid proposal, and the basic idea is this. In a 64 millisecond, either you can access a few rows a lot of times, thousands of times, or you can access a large number of rows few times. You can't access millions of rows thousands of times. You only have a 1.4 million budget, right? So you cannot really access both, lots of them and lots of times. We had lots is like hundreds of thousands. Right. And if you look at, um, there's some characterization data. These are spec benchmarks, MPKI. <coughs> How many unique rows get access within 64 milliseconds? So these workloads actually access hundreds of thousands of rows. But how many rows actually get access more than 250 times? Few thousand, not more than that. Right. Average activation per row is not that much. Maybe it's few tens. We really need tracker entries only for this. Right. For everything else, we are fine. We actually don't need tracker entries. Instead of using a SRAM-based tracker to track all possible aggressor rows. Why don't we keep the tracker in the DRAM and use SRAM for just filtering the accesses to the tracker that's kept in the DRAM? That's the basic idea behind Hydra. Have the ability to have all rows because unless you have tracking for all possible aggressor rows, your tracker will break. If you need a SRAM for all possible aggressor rows, Lots of SRAMs. So the logical thing is, I want all possible aggressor rows, but not in SRAM, it should be in DRAM. Rather than caching, just use SRAM as a filtering mechanism. Do group counting. As long as your group counts are less than a certain threshold, you know that no other row in that group has ever reached the threshold. You don't really need to do any tracking for them. Only when the group exceeds certain threshold, enable tracking for that group. That's the basic idea behind this hybrid proposal. Instead of using SRAM for actual tracking, do group tracking. So let's say your threshold was 250. You do group tracking until let's say 200. So all rows index a direct map structure and go into their group increment a counter. If the counter is less than threshold, or let's say less than 200, you know that no row in that group has exceeded 200 because even the sum total is 200, less than 200. <coughs> Only if the sum total increases by a certain amount, then you start accessing the rows that are kept in memory, and of course you have a cache that ca caches those. But you don't really use that unless this overflows. Let me explain that with an example. So you access a row, you go to this filter, you ask the filter, is the activation count less than 200? The filter says yes. Okay, just increment the counter and we're done. Don't have to do anything. And this is really what happens for most of the rows because most of the rows are activated only a few times. But let's say it says no, this group has reached 200, then say okay, 
I'm going to start doing the DRAM based tracking only for these rows. Go access the cache. If it's in the cache, fine. If it's not in the cache, then go to DRAM and get the entry. And how often these things happen? For 90% of the accesses, just this is fine. 9% of the accesses, this is okay. Why? Because not everything is going here. Only 10% of the things are going here. So in effect, this is like 10x larger. And a very small fraction actually go to DRAM. And so the, the, the filter takes off the, the pressure on the, the row count cache. And the, in terms of how expensive the structure is, it's about 50-ish kilobytes per rank. Right? Not the 700 kilobyte or 2 megabyte that we were talking about. <coughs> how does this perform? This figure shows the normalized performance <coughs> compared to an unsecured baseline. For the DRAM based scheme, the best SRAM based scheme that requires about 700 kilobyte and our scheme that requires about 60 kilobytes. The DRAM based scheme has about 25% performance loss. Both graphene as well as Hydra has less than 1% performance loss. So you get the same protection as purely SRAM based solutions that are prohibitively expensive but at a much, much lower SRAM overhead. Any questions so far? Yes. How did you segregate the workloads? Workloads are not segregated in group. Rows are segregated in group. So if you have a 32 kilobyte table, and let's say 2 million rows, 2 million divided by 32 would be 32. All right, 2 million divided by 32K is 32 rows per group. So first 32 rows go to the, the first entry. Next 32 rows goes to the second entry. Third goes to the third entry. Sir, Sushant this side, sir. Yes, Sushant. Sir, DRAM is much better than SRAM. That is what you want to say because the uh, penetration power at DRAM is the, 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 the result that we get is the lowest, isn't it? Less percentage. No, so DRAM is low cost, right? SRAM is, low cost. yes. DRAM you can buy like 32 gigabytes for about $32. Yes. SRAM 32 megabytes will cost you like a few hundred dollars. Yes, sir, yes. Sir. So, so Hydra, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, Anand Pekasai, mm -hmm. so you talked about very important factor, the RX threshold, right? Mm -hmm. So, like how this RX threshold is upon, like I'm working in this field, but I have seen that a lot of papers, they find this threshold using the FPGA, right? Or through some software level study or through DRAM kind of, you know, changing the frequency voltage. So, for, like these are the different techniques. Now, how they merge them and how they finally say, okay, this is the threshold value for this particular LPDP or Yes. So, so very good question, right? All of these, all of the studies in Rohamer area is dependent on defining a threshold at which you get bit flip. Who defines this threshold? So far it has been left to academics to characterize DRAM because memory vendors don't want to talk about it, right? From their perspective, they're like, oh look, we did TRR, this solved the problem, now you don't have to, to worry about it, but of course TRR was broken. So, so there is no better way at this point to say what's the threshold except for somebody to characterize it. Ideally, your memory vendor should be doing this and telling you that for this memory module, the threshold is this. But they are not there yet. Hopefully, they will get there at some point. Okay, but from academia point of view, because I'm a research scholar, so I'm working in this. So how should should I do all these different studies and then accumulate, okay, this will be the threshold <coughs> FPG and when it goes to the real uh, kind of a study, like when operating system comes in the picture, right, things may change of related to the average threshold. No, not really, right? It's it's not so much about the operating system or software. It's about how many activations you do, right? Regardless of who is doing it, OS is doing it, FPG is doing it. How many activations you do? Uh, to get a bit flip. The reason why it's done with FPGA is it's easier to measure, right? 
hardware currently doesn't tell you how many activations you have done on a particular row. Okay. Thank you so much. So, so one tracker, ho hopefully uh, th this made sense. Now I'll tell you why we needed something else. Like, go ahead. So, so where is these memory controller. RCC is present at the memory controller. Right, so both this and this is at the memory controller and this is in within the DRAM addressable space. Yes? Good question. So, so we, we have a section security that the rows that store the counters can also be hammered. So we have counters for those rows as well, but now the counters for those rows are only few. So why, like, and where does this stop? Let's say you have two million rows, right? Two million rows is roughly 16 gigabyte. You need only one byte per row. So how much do you need for two megabyte? Two megabyte divided by eight kilobyte is about 256 rows. For 256 rows, you just need 256 bytes. You can just keep that in the memory controller. All right, so you don't have to do this recursively. The counters for the rows that store the count is kept at the memory controller. Good question. So now let me tell you about this upcoming paper. It will be brief. Uh, so I've, I've just told you that, wow, look, this tracker is good. It, it solves the problem. You can get about 500 threshold or so at, at a very low cost. So why do we need uh, to do something more? By the way, this, this work was led by Anish. Anish is a former student of Beswa, and he has been prolific. Uh, I, I'll be talking about three of his papers in the next <coughs> few minutes. So what's the problem? Well, what if the thresholds kept getting lower and lower? Right. So that 57 kilobytes was for two rank, but I can, of course, have more ranks in the system. Let's say I have two channels, four ranks. Then as thresholds reduce, I have two choices. I can keep the Hydra storage constant. It just means that now more and more things will go through the filters. Or I can keep increasing the, 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 the metadata state for track. And we, we have both constant or proportionate. So if your thresholds keep reducing, these structures will need to scale. Otherwise, there will be a significant slowdown. So if you find ourselves at a threshold of 64, I don't know how or when we will get there, but let's say, ideally we need a solution that just works, right, for any threshold. So the idea, we, we sort of became a little bit more ambitious that why, why limit at 250 or 500? Ideally you want to track any threshold. We don't want to pay any SRAM. And we don't want to pay more than, let's say, 1% slowdown compared to an ideal tracker. If we can do that, then hopefully the tracking problem is solved, right? We can focus on other things. And the basic idea behind enabling this is that you need state. And we have state on our processors. It's the LLC. Right? So we're not asking for additional dedicated storage just for row hammer tracking. And if you had a very naive design, what would this be? You need 8 million counters, 16 megabyte cache, reserve half of the ways to just store counters, and now you have the space to store counters. Of course, this is a terrible design because the intels of the world will not give you half of their LLC just for tracking. But this is a proof of concept that, look, you can solve this without taking any additional dedicated storage, just leverage what you have. But terrible design, high slowdown, nobody would want to use it. But this has footprints of something that could actually be used. Workloads actually don't use all of the rows. They don't touch all of the millions of the rows in 64 milliseconds. They went through the entire memory space in 64 milliseconds. Guess what? Your locality will be terrible. Your caches are useless anyways. So workloads tend to access only a subset of the rows. For rows that you don't access, you don't need counters. 
Unit counter is only for the rows that you access. Why reserve counters for all of the rows? The basic idea was, yes, you can get up to eight ways, but start with zero ways. If something gets accessed, allocate one way. One way is actually good enough for about 32 counters and floating tags. Oh, you somehow access more than 32 rows that map to the set. Increase it to two. You can track 64. If that is not sufficient, then okay, fine. Get to the naive design. Naive design. But the, the, the basic insight here is that you can dynamically allocate the resources based on how much you need. Right? If you really, really need it, if you have a workload that touches everything, fine. You'll, you'll, you'll use 50%, but most workloads are not like that. So you'll possibly just use one way out of the 16 ways. And what does this need? Each set just needs two bits to tell you whether you're using zero ways, one way, two way, or eight way. It's a two bits per set. That's a dedicated storage. So what's the impact on the LLC capacity usage? If you had a naive design, you'd use 50% of the LLC capacity. If you're a dynamic design, it's about a little less than 10%. You actually have two workloads that access a lot. And this workload uses more than 10% of the cache. Any guesses what will be the performance impact for this workload, high or low? In, in dynamic, it will be low, sir. Yeah, yeah, in dynamic, it will be low, but there is a workload called CF. It does use 10, more than 10% of the cache. And there's a workload that uses maybe 6% of the cache. Which one will have higher slowdown? Thoughts? If you look at just the first three bars from the left, the first one has like 12% capacity usage, second one has like 8%, the third one is 6%. Thoughts on what will have a higher performance impact or cash miss rate impact? Take a guess, guessing is okay. First one, right? That that's now I'll tell you another stat, and I should really just hide this. The impact on CF is very low. It's zero. The blue bar is not even visible. The blue bar for the second and third is actually visible. Why would that be? I know, I should have just like <laughs> hidden this. If a workload tends to access a lot and a lot of rows, it's not reusing those rows. So it doesn't really matter what you do to the cache space. <laughs> right? So if your workload accesses only a few rows, it has high temporal locality, we don't take away too much cache space. If your workload accesses a lot, a lot of rows, we take away a decent amount. But guess what? It doesn't really matter. So it's, it's a good state to be in. For threshold of 64, ideal tracker, the, the static scheme, which will have high performance overhead and the dynamic scheme that we discuss. And of course, we can't do anything to the mitigation overhead. The mitigation overhead are what they are. So we only compare versus the ideal tracker. And we are within 1% of the ideal tracker. So here is a scheme where the Intel and the AMDs of the world, they don't really have to commit to anything except for four kilobyte. If they don't want the feature, they can just turn it off, nothing changes. If the memory companies have done a bad job and memories are failing, they can just turn it on. It'll cost less than 1% performance. Right. So, And this solves a tracking problem. It doesn't matter whether the threshold is 64 or 32 or 16. This will just work. So theoretically, you can never solve a threshold of one because to solve a threshold of one, you need to do two activations, which will do four activations, which will do eight activations. So I, I, we have a solution for row press. Let's let's talk. There's a there's a very nice way to solve row press that just makes row press unnecessary. Okay. Questions so far? 
Uh, whether threshold of 16 is practical? The, the objective of this work was to just stop the work in tracking. Like it doesn't matter what tracking you want, here it is, let's move on. Right? Because if, if we did 64, somebody might say, well, is there a need for below? Like, okay, pick whatever you want, this will work. It, it requires like four kilobyte of dedicated storage. Everything else is dynamically taken and the performance overhead is less than 1%. Okay. So now let me quickly move to the second part, mitigation. Yes. So this is on LLC, right? This is not stored in memory. So there are no counters in DRAM. Go ahead. Yeah, so if, if you take a laser beam and point to the LLC and flip bits, that's possible, but then that's possible to do even registers or normal data, right? No, so, so the, these are stored in the... Uh, user can access a line that... Okay, so when you reserve a memory, uh, reserve a particular area in the LLC, that is not accessible to store normal data. So if, if let's say, 16-way cache, one-way cache is not available to store the normal data, right? But the remaining 15 ways can store data, but that one way is always there for storing Ruhama information. It's never evicted. So the okay. eviction policy is unaffected. That's correct. You just sort of reserve. For each set, the. Oh. Okay. So now let's move to the, 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 the mitigating action. Remember, I said that Ruhama has two parts tracker and mitigation. Let's hold on for one minute. Let me get through a couple of things and I'll, I'll come back. Remember I said that now attackers are using the, the mitigating action itself to cause more failures. So we can't really just use victim refresh. What's the basic problem here? The basic problem is that if something gets attacked a lot, you do something to other rows to mitigate the victim rows. You do nothing to the aggressor. The aggressor and victim are still nearby. The aggressor is still free to keep attacking the victims. You're maintaining the spatial proximity of the aggressor and victim. So there was a question about temperature rising. Think about in COVID pandemic, if there is somebody who is getting access a lot, temperature is rising, what do we do? move them somewhere else. That's what we do. Room migration. Rather than keeping the aggressor and the victim in the same area, if you have an aggressor that gets access a lot, swap it with a random row in memory. If it gets aggressor gets access again, swap it with another aggressor row in memory. So an aggressor can never sort of be in the same proximity for a very long time. It's hard to create complex attacks, like half double. You br you're breaking the spatial proximity between the victim and the uh, aggressor. So this is something that we propose in ASPOS 22. And of course, because there is a, the mapping between the actual row and the physical row is changed, you need a tracker that keeps track of. Um, there's an indirection table that keeps track of where the, where the rows are. How random is random? So how many times do you need to randomize? But then you can't read everything if I close that if I put that. Yeah, so you, you, you <laughs> assume that it's coming from a cipher. Right. But the question is how frequently should you swap? My threshold is 4,000. Can I just do 3,999 and swap? There's something called as birthday paradox that comes in. Right. If you keep an attacker can just accidentally discover something that has been swapped. So, so we did some math and turns out that you need to move roughly when one-sixth of the damage is done 
to be protected against birthday paradox attacks. So if the threshold is 4,666, it's not so bad. The threshold is 1,000, it's only 166. This is actually pretty bad. And if you're operating at 1K, then randomized row swap requires like 20% slowdown, lots of SRAM. Uh, this was before all of the tracker work was done. So we came up with another scheme, and this is again, that was led by Anish. And the idea here was again inspired from COVID-19. Develop, instead of randomization, use isolation. If it's the aggressor gets access a lot, have a quarantine region in memory, or you just take the row and keep it in the quarantine region. Right. And if the aggressor keeps getting access, move it from one quarantine region to the other. This is much more efficient. Why? Because security doesn't depend on randomization. You don't have to move at one sixth. You can just move at t. Second, it's a move. It's not a swap. So it's two x efficient. You don't have to do read x, read y, write x, write y. You just have to read x, write x. Right. So it's a lot more efficient. It requires tables for forward pointer, and the tables in the rows in the quarantine region needs reverse pointer. Because quarantining is a lot more efficient, it doesn't do too many row migrations. This is the total number of row migrations for the row swap and aqua. It's roughly 10x lower. Right. And, and if you look at the performance difference, randomized row swap at 1k requires about 20% slowdown. Aqua is about a percent, percent and a half. And this was for DDR4. Right. So you can swap rows, you can quarantine rows. So good, how big should be the quarantine region? The quarantine region should be sufficiently big such that even if I'm attacking the same row again and again, it's guaranteed to never leave the quarantine region within 64 milliseconds. So we derive that and we derive that for, for different thresholds. At low threshold, what happens is that your memory system is just busy doing row migration. You cannot do too many row migrations. So the quarantine region is roughly between 1% or 2% of the entire DRAM region. That, that, that's a good question. So, so we derive that, how big it should be to ensure security. Currently, we move them sequentially. But under our assumption that you can never cause row hammer unless you do T activations on a row, that is maintained, right? You can never do, at the moment you reach T activation, you get migrated. At the moment you do T, you get migrated. <coughs> that, that's correct. So, so given a threshold, this will work for that threshold. Now, what is the threshold? You get to define that. This is conventional, uh, no overhead. This, Normalized performance compared to an unsecure baseline. Yes. Yes. How much can the memory control has So for the first one, row and direction. For the second one, just quarantine area, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there has there have effects on something like the row and direction. There might be other effects in the row and direction. So so we'll have to bound how many entries are required in the row and direction table to ensure security, and and we derive that that so that. Something in row and direction. So in row swap. Whenever you swap, right? So, so you, there are always a tuffle that's created. X maps to Y, Y maps to X. No, this is. We assume that uh, you have a memory controller with enhancements. And uh, so, Aqua is, is 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 quite efficient. It works at like one k. And and if you go to DDR five, this drops down to about 0.9 percent because it has 2x the banks. Each bank, one percent of each bank, but then that's one percent of memory, right? Because 
So, so good question, and we derive it to be about 2.5x, which is actually not that bad, right? You can always cause row buffer conflict to somebody and cause them like 3x low down. <coughs> but the, the question to ask is fine, you're showing us for 1k threshold, but you just told us that thresholds can reduce. You're taking an entire 6, 8 kilobyte row and you're moving it somewhere else. If you're doing it at every 1k activation, that's okay. What if you're doing it for 100 activation? Would that still be okay? And this is just a preview, one slide, right? I'm not going to present much. This is, again, a work done by Anish. Thank you for sending Anish. <laughs> um, Aqua, the work that I presented, 1K at DDR5, it's about 1%. 128, it increases to about 15%. The row swap thing, 60%. There's another work from some other group called Block Hammer. It just tells you that you can only do that many activations to a row. It does rate control, 600% slow down. What if we really wanted these mitigations at low threshold? Sorry, can't have it, too expensive. Why are these solutions causing so much slowdown? Because some rows actually reach 128. Why are these rows reaching 128? I have millions of rows in memory, right? You just told me that I can only do 1.4 million activations my bank has 128,000 rows. You divide 1.4 million by 28 activation. Each row should get only about eight activations. Why are these rows getting 100, 200? The reason is you map a row to a page. A row typically has lines from nearby pages. When you access something in a page, you're more likely to access other things in that page. So almost all of your accesses are focused on few rows in memory because that's where your pages are mapped. If you have 16 gigabyte memory and you have 16 megabyte of working set, guess what? Only those rows are getting used. Right. Why are we doing this? Why do we have spatial proximity? Because we have learned that that's a good thing to do for row buffer heads. That's actually a terrible thing to do for these mitigations. Instead of having lines that have spatial proximity in the same row buffer, why don't we just spread them out, randomize it. Take the line address, pass it through an encryptor, then access memory. Now if I access 1, 2, 3, 4, guess what? They will not go to the same row. They will get spread out. Say, I want row buffer heads. Fine. Gang two lines together. Now take the gang address, pass it through a randomizer, spread it out through memory. Right. So you still get some row buffer heads depending on your gang size. Gang size of one, no row buffer. Gang size of two, up to 50%. Gang size of four, up to 75% row buffer heads. What happens? The number of hot rows the rows that actually reach here. Under different Intel mapping, 10,000 rows in 64 milliseconds. Under randomization, if you had just gang size of one, never reached. You have gang size of four, about 30 or 40. About 200x reduction in hot rows. If you reduce the hot rows, of course you're not gonna pay this. You're gonna pay this. So 1%, roughly 1% with GS4, about 2% with GS2, about 2.5% or one, uh, a couple of percent with for block number. So if you just randomize, you can drop everything down to about 2%. Right, so you can make secure row hammer mitigations scalable to this, just a minor change in the memory <coughs> control, just indexing function. Right, so let me conclude. Ruhammer is the most prominent mode of data failure. As, as uh, Biswa mentioned, that there is another thing in the town called row press. What I expect is that as, as cells become smaller and crummier and crummier, there will be just more and more modes of failure. And how we deal with these modes of failure in a low-cost manner 
will define if we can scale to the next generation or not. We talked about Rohamer. Rohamer was discovered about a decade ago. Even after a decade of research, if anything, this problem has even worsened. Right? Our solutions just don't work. There are more vulnerabilities. And if we are to develop reliable and secure memory, uh, we would really need to think about not just how things are now, right? what thresholds are now, but we really should think about five, ten years down the line. What will be the state and what's needed to done to secure those systems, to make those systems reliable? And our ability to solve these problems really affects whether we can scale down further and further. Remember, scaling is a tide that raises all boats. We need scaling. Right? And if we can develop low-cost solutions, we can help scaling. And most importantly, uh, I hope you get that from, from this talk, that making systems secure, reliable, and at a low cost is a lot of fun. Right? So I encourage you to work in this area. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. And as always, I'm always looking for motivated students. If you're interested in this area, again, reach out to me. Questions? Yes. <coughs> There are no ideal conditions. You can actually, there are now websites that say, row hammer my laptop, and you can just row hammer your laptop. Not, yeah, it doesn't require, I mean, for security attacks, you will need to know certain things. To cause bit flips, you don't need anything. You can just access some rows a lot. Yeah. So to cause a row hammer attack, you just need six instructions. Access X, access Y, Flush X, flush Y, fence. Five. Five instructions. That's it. You need to make sure that X and Y map to the same bank. Different row. It's about a few seconds worth of access pattern checks. But the to cause bit flips in your row hammer is like almost trivial. People now give it for assignments. Can be, yes. That's correct. So I know I know Gururaj visited <laughs> here. He actually spent a year at NVIDIA that I'm not supposed to be talking about. You should ask him if GPU DRAMs are vulnerable. Maybe he can share more. So what about other kinds of metrics which are non DRAM? So it's, it's like, uh, Earth is warming up, let's find another planet. But like usually what happens is that those other planets have even worse problems. And it's the same case with memory. DRAM has problems. You pick whatever, it has actually worse other kind of problems, right? So PCM, I, uh, pa my past life went on PCM. It has endurance issues, read disturb, write disturb. <coughs> so you get all of these problems plus even more problems. <laughs> So I don't, I don't think moving to them because of reliability is the right answer. Yes, there's a question on the line. Thank you so much for that also. I just, uh, you have worked a lot of on Rohammer, right? So I've seen that uh, in the uh, academia world, this Rohammer, like people say, okay, we have, you know, improved it or, okay, threshold and we have refreshed it again, the industry adapted, right? And then again, they say, okay, again, this is not working. Even they have post, you know, problem is uh, again degraded. So how the industry looked at this problem? You know, like you have worked a lot and uh, this is not a technical maybe of overview kind of thing. So, so the, no, the, the problem is more economical, right, rather than technical. Industry is at a point where they acknowledge that their trackers are broken. JEDEC actually has two white papers that says that trackers deployed in DDR4 do not work for all patterns. This is like the biggest own me that you can ever get from industry and industry, industry consortium. So they know that their, their trackers are broken. They know that their devices fail with row hammer. The question is, who will pay for this? If you go to Intel and AMDs of the world, they say, it's not a processor problem. Why, why should I pay for it? If you go to the memory companies, they say, we can't afford to solve this problem. Somebody else should. 
So that's where we are stuck, right? Rather than getting stuck, I'm hopeful that if we can come up with something which is almost zero cost for processor vendor, or we figure out a way to have trackers that can be inside DRAM and do a very good job of, of tolerating row hammer, then we can move the ball forward. But currently that's the state. A, I don't think that they're denying that they're broken. B, it's just like they, they are playing football that <coughs> not my problem, you should solve it, memory companies. Memory companies say, too expensive for us to solve, we will not be able to solve it. Uh, like my point of view is like, to uh, you know, perform the Ruhamel number of things one has to do, like they should know the physical address mapping and then they have to figure out, okay, where are these uh, victim or the addresses to go are located. So like uh, I feel sometimes that uh, Ruhamel is not so much vulnerable, like uh, if there are a number of attacks, right, the real world attacks. So do we consider the RH attack as that vulnerable? So yes and no, right? Uh, I, and then this is a mindset that I'm trying to change of people who work in Rohammer. Typically, people view Rohammer as something that I write an attack code and I can cause a bit flip, but if I don't have attack code, this is not a problem. That was probably an okay model for thinking when thresholds were like 32,000 or 100,000. When your thresholds are at about 1,000, guess what? Even BZIP will cause bit flips. Right? So, we're reaching a point where we can't just say that this this is a low priority attack, so we are not going to look at it. If we don't solve this problem, you might be running your typical workloads and might still have bit flips, right? So, so, so the problem is, yeah, the problem is becoming a little yeah. bit more severe. Yeah, actually, for sometimes working in this RH, I feel like uh, you know whether it is really the paper that you're doing in your world says, okay, this is very, very you know prominent or very important attack, but uh, sometimes I feel like, is it really like, sometimes the thinking changes, so that's what I want to know from your perspective that like you are working for a long time and you have some students and everything. Yeah, so I, 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 I actually started working on this like very aggressively after attending the DRAM SEC workshop about two and a half years ago. So all of the work that I presented is, has happened in the last two, two and a half years. Um, we did. We were working on DRAM in 2014, DRAM Rohammer in 2014, but then when Owner's Group's paper came out, it was like a really nice characterization. We had analytical models. We're like, okay, this is a very good paper from Owner. It has probabilistic solutions similar to ours. This problem is solved. We don't have to worry about it, right? But then we didn't really work on it for about six, seven years. But after looking at half double, I got really, really interested that look, here is a problem that's becoming worse and worse. There are no guaranteed solutions for solving this and people just come up, keep coming up with new attacks. Perfect things for working on, right? People care about this, there is no solution and if you can come up with a solution, that's good. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have one more question from the audience. Uh, I'm happy to hang around. Feel free to come by and chat. Okay.